Conservative Senator Nancy Ruth turned 75 last week, bringing her 11-year service in the Senate to an end. As she prepares for her next adventure, how does the former senator feel when she looks back at her time in the Red Chamber? What does she think about recent changes meant to modernize the place? Joining me now, former Senator Nancy Ruth. Nice to see you. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, you know, you've, you've had a little bit of time out of the upper chamber now, um, and, and you've, you've, you've left it. How, how are you doing? What is your, are you, do you have a different perception of the red chamber now that you've, now that you've gone? Oh, I think it's too early. Yeah. The whole chamber's in flux. It'll be a few years before we figure out what's up. And, you know, it's a power game, and we have to wait for those marbles to come crashing down on best intentions. <laughs> so so the, the, the intention, of course, is to try and make the Senate less partisan. Do you see that as realistic, and do you, do you think it can happen? I think there are many of the new senators who would like to work collegially, but I don't think that's what the politics is about. Mm. So... We'll see. We'll wait and see. But if, this, if the new senators themselves are not, do you, do you think that they are not partisan or do you think that they are um, just pretending not to be partisan? How would you characterize that? I don't think approach? they're driven in their partisan way like those of us who came in mm -hmm. and sat in party caucuses. So, so what, what is the power play that, that's happening well, then? People who come into politics usually want power to change something. Mm -hmm. And... I'm sure everyone who's come in does too. They want to be able to do this and do that, and they're going to have to learn how to do that. But they're not in a caucus. They don't have access weekly to cabinet ministers. Uh, I don't know how it's going to happen, Rosemary, but I am waiting to see. But you were you you were yourself appointed as an independent, and then yes. moved into the Conservative caucus. And did you? Why did you explain to people why you did that? Because you saw no other way to work, or because you felt more aligned with the party? Why? Why did you end up doing that? Well, a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I was appointed as a progressive conservative uh, independent. Yeah. So it was natural for me to go to the conservative party. And why not? Uh, Harper had won, and I wanted to be in the play. So I joined up. And, and what, do you, what difference did it make to you to, to, to be Access aligned? to power. Huge difference. When I, when I, that year I sat as an independent, I could hardly get to speak to the leader of the government. Mm. I could, but that was in the Senate, that is. But once you join a caucus, you have access to the ministers, to the prime minister, every week, if not more frequently. There's all the difference in the world. Yeah. The, the Senate went through, obviously, a couple of bumpy years there um, in terms of expenses. And, and you yourself, uh, there was, you know, some criticism of you. And, and um, well, we won't get into the details. But what, what do you make now that we're on the other side of it, that things seem to be a little more open? And, and the senators, at any rate, seem to be uh, more, seem to be more um, accountable, maybe, is the word, or seem to be more uh, trying harder to make sure that they're... Uh, vigilant in terms of how they're spending money. That's not my perception at all. No, okay, tell I me. I think senators have been accountable. Mm -hmm. They have been concerned about their budgets, and the press seem to be paying more attention now. Mm. That's, it's the press that's made the difference. I don't think the senators' behavior has radically changed. But there are some senators who caused the behavior to be under the microscope or def in the spotlight yes, but in a different that way. Wasn't, that wasn't part of my life in the Senate. I mean, that isn't why I went to the Senate, and it isn't how I spent my time. So what are some of the things, uh, Ms. Ruth, that, that you did in the Senate that you are most proud of, your legacy, if you will? In the chamber, I'm proud of the fact that I introduced the, the first Senate bill on doctor-assisted death. I was very proud of the fact that uh, I initiated with Prime Minister Harper and supported his bill uh, to include sex disability, and age in the uh, hate and genocide provisions mm -hmm. of the criminal code. We've been waiting over 40 years for that to happen. And mm -hmm. finally, we had a prime minister who was willing to do it, and I was so glad he picked up on my suggestion. So those are two legislative things. Uh, in committee, I think uh, the things I'm probably most proud of are, are, uh, are raising the issue of the Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how Canada was then in Afghanistan, how was the Canadian military implementing them? How were they not implementing them? How has it developed in the years since we did that study? And how, how will it reflect when we send our troops to Africa? I mean, these are very important yeah. things that we should do. I was concerned about peace. So one of the things um, outside of uh, 
committee that I did was to suggest to the minister and the CEOs of the War Museum and the Muse Museum of History that they change the name of the War Museum to the Peace Museum. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens with that. I also, in committee, uh, oh, raised all kinds of issues, but one that's coming up now and will report probably in February is a study of gender-based analysis comparing Canada with the European Union. So, so tell me this. Do you, do you think you're going to miss it? No. <laughs> It's what? somebody else's time to battle those battles. So what, no. what, what are you going to do then, Ms. Ruth? Well, I'm going to uh, go through that and some of the rest of my life as a feminist activist. I'm going to continue as a feminist activist. I'm going to march from Queen's Park to the American consulate here in Toronto. Uh, after Trump is sworn in, I'm on the Women's March for Millions, and I'm going to... Uh, uh, maybe write a book or work with someone to write a book. Mm -hmm. I am going to remind all my friends who remain in Parliament that now that we've had the second audit on gender-based analysis, we must have the third audit in another five-year period, and I will remind them when the time comes. And I have passed a number of things on to uh, some of the new senators. It's a very different Senate now than the one I was in. Yes. There are a lot of feminists in this yes. Senate, yeah. and that's both men and women, and this is just... Great. So, like, uh, one of the other things I did around Parliament that you never hear about is um, my concern when I went to museums like what was then the Museum of Civilization and saw how excluded the women and minority groups were from any discussion on virtually any issue, yeah. whether it was a show that was traveling in or something we mounted ourselves. So with the Minister of, the, uh, of Heritage at the time and the CEO of what's now the Museum of History, I spent hours and hours, I can't believe how many hours it took, to make a serious imp implant into those committees that were designing the new Canada Hall right. and to make sure that women and minority groups were well represented and that their contributions to Canada were celebrated. So lot, lots lots, of legacy and lots of work ahead, it sounds like, because knowing you, there's retirement. Oh, yeah, retirement. always a watchdog, yeah, always yeah. a watchdog. There you go. All right, Nancy Ruth, good <laughs> of you to make the time. Happy retirement, although it doesn't sound like there'll be a lot of uh, retirement happening. But ha well, I'm waiting to sing, sing Oh Canada the right way, too. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nancy Ruth. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.